Good afternoon. My name is Dina O'Malley. I am the um, Program Development Specialist for the Center of Cancer Survivorship at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. And I am here to introduce you to the um, public forum component of our annual retreat on cancer research in New Jersey. And today we have a program for you that starts with Bioinformatics Changing the Landscape on Cancer Research. And our speaker is Eric Paraxelis. He is the Vice President of Research and Development Informatics, bio in Biotechnology, Immunology, and Oncology for Center Core. So without further ado, bring you. <laughs> Hi. So I'll, I'm going to one crutch this. So if I jiggle around, don't take it personal that I'm, I'm just kind of doing this. This is the first time I've worn clothes in two weeks because I had my hip operated on almost exactly two weeks ago. I, I'm just, I was thinking of not going back to clothes, but anyway, um, there's a lot to do with it. So I figured everybody wanted to share that, right? Um, so first of all, thanks thanks for having me. Uh, you know, so as as Dina mentioned, I'm the head of uh, research informatics for the immunology, oncology, and biotechnology arm of Johnson and Johnson. So most of you in New Jersey know J and J. I'm also uh, working with the State Department, the National Cancer Institute, helping build a brand new cancer and biotechnology center in Amman, Jordan. Um, Amman is, is is a very close, uh, you know, obviously important. A neighbor and ally to the U.S. and there's a great unmet medical need over there in cancer. So I go over there about once a week, once a month, for a week, back and forth to Jordan until until this. And uh, I'm the director, just to keep going, for the Kidney Cancer Association uh, on the board of directors, and I'm the chairperson for the Survivorship Advisory Board for the Center for Cancer Survivorship for CINJ, amongst other things. So and that's all my disclosures. But let me really introduce myself because none of that really matters. I'm 42, yes, that's right, um, married, I have a seven-year-old daughter, my background is in chemical engineering, and I am a stage three kidney cancer survivor of four years. Um, when I was 19, I lost my father to head and neck cancer. In the next few years, um, well, the story would be, I lost my father to head and neck cancer. I was from Boston. I had some family that helped me get through college. I moved down south to be with them, and I lost that cousin to head and neck in 1999. His 17-year-old daughter we lost two years later. At one point, they were getting chemotherapy in adjacent rooms. So when you think about cancer survivorship and what cancer can do to families, you know, I actually win the wrong type of contest sometime in this, in this type of a thing. Um, and then we actually lost uh, another child in that family to a traffic accident a few years later, which I actually believe is cancer-related. Um, he's a very depressed child. Um, currently, in addition to myself, I have two cousins and a stepfather that are cancer survivors and under active surveillance. So I'm going to talk about bioinformatics, but I want to kind of try to talk about the two personalities I bring. One is being a scientist and one is being a survivor. And there's actually a lot of overlay when, when you approach this disease that way. You know, the scientist looks to find cancer where it hides in genes and proteins and cells and organs. What are the signals? What are the switches? What turns cancer on? What makes cancer spread? What makes good tissue go bad? You know, what, what's, what's going on there? How do the behaviors that we have in produce, our health, our body weight, whether we smoke or not, nutrition, all these things. And then disparities. Does everybody in this country really have equal access to health care? I don't believe so. And other, other things that affect, you know, if you get cancer, what is your prognosis? What is your opportunity for the best treatment, et cetera? Um, and then, uh, and, you know, but that's as a scientist, as a survivor, it's much easier. I don't want my cancer to come back. I don't want my daughter to know what cancer is or to get it. And I don't want anyone else I know to get it. So not a lot of schizophrenia there, pretty clear, but, but also pretty direct. It's really hard. So how do you actually get active and make that happen, even if you're not a scientist? Because <laughs> right? any, anybody and everybody can help and should be involved in this that, that, that feels they want to. Well, it's daunting, but the processes are similar. Whether you're a science, scientist or a patient or a supporter of a patient or a family member, you're trying to take the data that's being tossed at you or that you're trying to, some, you're trying to get information and knowledge to empower yourself to make decisions and to have the best outcomes. Again, that, that's also somewhat of a definition of a scientific process, regardless of what you're doing. So a lot, lot of parallels here. So now I'm going to do maybe four slides that are technical on bioinformatics, and then I'll, I'll bring it back more to, to the survivorship perspective. 
So I pulled these right out of Wikipedia. That way they'd be accessible. And if you wanted to look them up, you'd know where to go. Right, just, just to make it really easy. So the, in, in, in Wikipedia, bioinformatics is the application of information technology to the field of molecular biology. And me molecular biology chiefly concerns itself with understanding the interactions between the various systems of a cell, including the interactions between DNA, RNA, protein biosynthesis, as well as the regulations of those interactions. And the primary goal of both these things, obviously, is to increase the understanding of biological processes. So that's kind of the, the textbook definition of what, what bioinformatics is. Um, we're going to have much more knowledgeable and better speakers on, on genetics and, and this stuff, so I'm not going to go into it much. I'm simply going to introduce a few terms that I'm, that I'm going to go through. Um, genes, the basic unit of heredity comprised of DNA. Um, and then active genes, amongst other things, are involved in specifying and creating RNA. RNA is central to the creation of proteins, and proteins are essential parts of organisms and chemicals that basically participate in all biochemical processes within a cell. And they're structural, they're immune, they're antigens, they're, they're lots of things, but proteins are really the core um, of, of most cellular functions, enzymes, et cetera. So if that's the system and we're looking at genes and proteins and actions in a cell, what, what do you really do? Well, we sequence and analyze. So you've heard about the human genome and sequencing the human genome. So sequence analysis is an important activity. Annotating genes, what parts of genes are active, what parts of genes are actives in what, in what processes. Evolutionary biology, how have things changed over time within the cell. Gene expression is extremely important. What genes are turning on, genes are turning off. And by, is, is a disease state where we have a gene that's over, you know, regulated or over amplified or that it's putting out too much product, et cetera. Mutations in cancer, et cetera. Comparing genomics, whether it's cross species, whether it's within a healthy patient to an unhealthy patient. Someone who responds to a drug to someone who may not have responded to a drug, right? Modeling biological systems. High throughput imaging, analysis, different pictures, something, what's going on here, can you see it on a camera? Whether it's a, a picture of a cell that you're trying to understand, or whether it's a chest x-ray of, of a patient, et cetera. So high throughput analysis. Can we look across many, many images, hundreds of thousands of them, and draw out attributes that will help us find things earlier or predict what might happen? Protein-protein interactions. And then often we do a lot of developing of software and tools because we have a new idea. We have to write software to do it computationally. So I was going to stick to just a few, a few things with bioinformatics, and this is very, very um, biased towards the discovery of new drugs and new medicines, um, So it's what I do. So one is defining what the disease is, a disease definition, and not as easy as, as that may, may appear sometimes. Patient stratification is really, you may have heard the term personalized medicine. That's baked in here, but it really is, is how are people that have this certain type of cancer alike and how are they different? Why, does the, why did this group of people respond to a drug but that group of people didn't? And could we have predicted that, et cetera? Drug target identification, what biological process can we change or augment to come up with a new drug? Can we, can we react earlier so we don't have the same side effects? Can we, can, you know, what, what is, so finding new targets to build drugs against is a big piece. Indication selection. Um, so now we've figured out that we can inhibit the development of a protein that we think is linked to cancer. Well, who do you test it on? What, do you take it into breast first, prostate first, leukemias first, and why? How do you make those selections is, is very important. Um, and of course, the epidemiology of it, which to me, population science is really central. And the way I think about this is I have to understand many, many people if I'm going to j help even just a few of them. Because again, what does normal look like? What does different look like? And what might be individual? You actually have to study tens of thousands of people to try to bring it together. So for disease identification, cancers we know classically identified solely by the, the affected organ system, breast cancer, because there's lots of different types of tumors, but they occur in the breast. We call it breast cancer. That's fine. But we're also finding out that sometimes the basic biology transcends these organ definitions. And you may actually find pathologically that a certain protein is expressed in lots of different tumor types. And so if it works in this, it may work in this. Or if it works in this and doesn't work for that 
that's interesting. Can we try to figure out why, <laughs> you know, and get closer to understanding how these things really, really work? And then the subtypes within subtypes. I think that that's, that's something that we, we keep learning more and more, and, and people see this more and more um, as we try to figure out um, to classify the diseases, the treatments, and responses at a molecular level, as opposed to just the tumor appeared in this organ. Patient stratification, as I mentioned, the need to understand the best treatment for any given molecular subtype of cancer. That's simple. Is this drug going to work for these people and, and why? And when isn't this drug going to work for these people and why? Which patient will respond best to which drug and why? What is the risk of metastasis of different cancers? You know, one of the things that happens is we often find cancers and in incidental findings. That we, this is very true in the kidney cancer world. And we really don't know, you know, kidney cancer can metastasize and, and be fatal, but a lot of them aren't. We have no idea which ones would ever metastasize and which ones wouldn't. You have to treat them all the same like they would. So you're potentially putting people through treatments that, because you're scared that, okay, if, if there's 8 out of 10 would never do anything, I would never risk a patient being one of the two that could. So you have to treat anyway. You remove that kidney or whatever, whatever the treatment is. So, you, you know, is there a way to figure it out? When is it okay not to treat if ever? Currently in our, our healthcare system, it's seldom oh, never okay not to treat. You almost always have to treat. You can't, you can't take the risk. And what is the best endpoint to measure? One of the things that um, I tell you from the, from the biotechnology industry is we have extremely crude measures of what a working drug looks like. You hear things like progression-free survival. Okay, they live this long, but then they get hit by a bus. Right, so you know, it's, it's not a direct measure of what that drug is doing or what that treatment is doing. Can we get to more direct measures of efficacy of a drug, of safety of a drug, as opposed to indirect measures? The tumor didn't get bigger for the number of weeks. Okay, that's good, but we don't really know other than that, and this is what we have today. So better endpoints to measure, I think, is someplace we, we, we need to and will do much better over time. Like I said before, it can be very challenging to associate molecular events to disease states. What often happens, and this may not sound like the right reason, but it, but it is, is that you typically take brand new novel medicines into, the, into clinical trials where you can get the most patients because you want to, and obviously there's the most unmet medical need in the big tumor types. doesn't mean sometimes that we actually have biological reason to go into that tumor type. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. And so that it's, it can be challenging to link a specific biological effect at that, bio, at that molecular level with a, with a large disease process. So that's a challenge. If I inhibit the production of a given protein, will a tumor stop growing? If it stops growing, will it shrink and die? Will it start growing later? Can I change a regulatory cascade and produce a desired outcome? And remember, DNA, RNA proteins pretty much controls everything if you're talking about that part of, of, of the cell cycle. Um, so again, it can be very challenging to associate molecular events with disease states, et cetera. Will it work better in breast, prostate breast? We have a, a drug that we had um, do very well in the last year uh, in multiple myeloma. Great results with, with a drug called Velcade that, that, um, that we work with. But we have no idea it has completely failed in a lot of the solid tumors. We, we simply don't know why that is. We don't understand it. You know, we tested it. It isn't working. We're studying it but we really don't know. It's a matter of studying those populations and saying, and even in multiple myeloma, it's, it's, it's a startlingly good response for some people and then not for others. And what is different and why? You know, it's, 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 it's a population science. But what we can do is, is do molecular profiling studies and see if that helps us figure out the next hypothesis. And I think that's important uh, with informatics. I think one of the most valuable things we do is we build these new scientific questions that we then follow up on in the lab, in the clinic, et cetera. And then, you know, epidemic population science and good population science is essential. Each humans have more than 20,000 genes which matter in which diseases at what time during the course of disease and treatment, that should be a question mark. There's lots of noise in the data. So if I happen to, if I'm doing a clinical trial and I see something really interesting in 30 of those people and I do the analysis and it looks like 300 genes are involved, it's really hard to see what's different in 300 genes with 30 people statistically. You know, you got to go back to a much larger set and see that. Now we, 
we're really, really diligent, and we won't let it go. We'll eventually find out. But that's why population science is essential. We need to study larger populations. And so again, we have to. We have to. So maybe a little bit of a, a paradox, but we have to study large populations to be able to help individuals. That's what's key. Now, all that said, I'm going to go back to my advocacy and my survivorship side. All of the above is as much a matter of ethics as it is a matter of science and medicine. And people, you know, we want people to get engaged. Clearly, all the folks here that, that aren't in the scientific tech, you're all very engaged. You're already here, which is great. You know, but really bringing an R&D approach in. You know, one way to look at it is drugs respond differently to different people. How many drugs that your family tastes were actually tested on people in New Jersey? compared to other states. And what does that, the, the socioeconomic differences look like? What does the racial distributions look like? What do all those things look like? You, there's a lot of, I know with my family, I'd, I'd, have, I'd want to test it as close to my family members as I could, if possible. That way I would know how they would respond versus others might respond. So I think it's very important to think population-wide and in a population sense. So the one way to do that is to encourage the participation in clinical trials. Um, but again, what does good look like? So I'm going to kind of go to this other side, a little bit more back over to the advocacy side and say, okay, so if, if, we're, if I have a family member or if it's me and I, ha I have been in clinical trials, they have those pictures at NCI of me in my underwear and all of that stuff, so I've been there. I, I didn't share them, don't worry, they're not next. Um, but, you know, when you, only if they're fake, there you go. But if anyone's, if anyone's approaching this as an issue or considering this, there, the clear, there is a clear understanding of what good has to look like. One, the background and overview. Why is a study being done? How many people are in the study? What is really going to be required of me if my f or my family member in the study? What actually happens when I show up for a visit during the study? What are you going to do? Um, what are the risks of being in the study and not being in the study? Do I get any benefits of taking care of the study? What are the choices are there? What about my privacy? Do, is it going to cost me anything or who's going to pay for it? Um, what are my rights as a participant? And who do I call if I have questions or problems? This is kind of like the absolute minimum that you would ever want to see in a consent form if you're going to do a study. So, of course, my message would always be we need everybody to participate in studies that can or that are appropriate to it. But it has to be good. And it has to be well done. And it has to be executed well. So quality matters almost more than anything else. So with my family background, I chose to do what I do mainly because I think it gives me and my family hope, and that's, that's a big driver, and I think hope is really important. But again, the tools haven't changed, whether I have my survivor hat on or my scientist hat on, whether I'm doing bioinformatics or whether I'm talking to my cousin who's going through her, her melanoma treatment. It's patience, persistence, and resilience. It's setting high goals. It's commit and participate, as you all are doing that are here, deliver and learn. And it's deliver and learn from each other. And that's why I think groups like the, the uh, survivorship program at CINJ and others like it are so important to try to bridge some of this. And how can you really help the science? Well, you know, obviously, believe it or not, cancer clinical trials can be very difficult to enroll. The big trials are easy. A lot of the small interesting trials, a lot of the trials you may see, it's, they can be very difficult to find the, the right types of patients to ask and answer the right questions. Considering enrolling. If you're not enrolling, but if you get called on a person, um, if people want information about loved ones or people you know, ask all the questions I had on that list, and if they answer them all correctly, consider sharing data. Really important. We don't have to have people into a study to be able to do good population science. Um, know how to access, find, and share clinical trial information. There's lots of groups that can help do this as well. I, one of the reasons why I'm doing the work in Jordan is the opportunity to work with um, millions of Palestinian and Iraqi refugees that have been displaced in the Mideast and to really look at the disparities of care that we have in this country and to work out something I'm very passionate about. So it's, it's one thing to be a researcher or to be a survivor and have to deal with a situation where there's no positive outcome possible because we don't have a cure. It's a totally different thing in the situations where we have good treatments and cures, but they're not available to everybody. The latter is something I'm completely intolerant of, and I think we all have to be intolerant of it. So uh, that's my message, pushing for intolerance. It's the only, only one you're going to hear me give like that. But I think it's essential. You have to do it. We have to, we have to make sure that it's not appropriate that a, a young you know, Latina female in Miami with cervical cancer would have a potentially a very different outcome than a, a young teenager in Bucks County where I live. It's just n not in this day and age. It, it can't be like that. 
So work to ensure early detection and treatment for all, and everything else I said applies here as well. Anything you can bring to it, you can do. If any of you are actually going through a process right now, you know, seek help for the survivorships, get educated to your comfort level. Doesn't matter if you don't know any of the science. Pick up where you can go or talk to someone. There's lots of people like myself and organ specific organizations that have scientists and nurses on the phone that will help you with any of the jargon. Just, just get the help you need. Share your knowledge and experiences. Believe it or not, you already know more than some people knew a few days before wherever you are right now. That's important. Lobby for funding for cancer research. Again, bit of a talking to the choir in this, in this room and at this event, but um, we still need to do more. Get involved in policy. Write your local issues. Sign up for ACR Action Alert. It's the American Association of Cancer Research. They'll literally say if, if Congress is supposed to vote at something on a federal level, they'll send you an email saying, blast this email to everybody you know. I get those too. Yeah, things like that. Tell everyone you know to do the same. It's amazing how in the information age, grassroots really do make a difference. So everybody likes this, especially all my employees like this slide. Um, me on a Monday morning. I actually usually don't look that good on a Monday morning. At least he's not on crutches. But what is the best medicine? It's still hope. That's my wife and daughter. Thanks so much for your time. Sure, sure. So that study. It's, it's actually a, it's a very, very good question. I think that medical systems that have good processes for, for doing informed consent, for recruiting people into clinical trials, uh, that have diverse populations, the people running these trials seek those places out. And what we need to do in New Jersey is get on those lists. And so the, the, you know, it's, in some ways, the more you do and the more you do it well, the more people will seek to do it here. So it's really establishing that, that culture of research. That's, that's a big help. I mean, specifically, how do, you, how do you do it? I mean, some of these are not trials of drugs. They could be trials of things yeah. as simple as yoga or um, diet. I mean, is it, I guess your brain association isn't with the school. You wouldn't hit with the CINJ with the survivorship. Yeah. But is there a way to reach out to 